The following is a world class bullshitters exclusive. There hasn't been a time in my life where Batman wasn't a part of it. Like many of you growing up in the 90s, Batman was my first superhero. From the movies to the comics, toys, and games, Batman had it all. The peak of that era was Batman the Animated Series. Since its inception, Batman the Animated Series has been the gold standard for all things Batman. The series redefined Batman for television, blending mature themes with children-friendly storytelling. Its innovative art style and iconic voice acting created a timeless atmosphere. The series expanded the Batman universe, introducing complex villains and morally ambiguous characters, something groundbreaking for children's television. Now, over 30 years later, some of the creative minds behind the classic cartoon are back with another attempt to redefine Batman with Batman Caped Crusader. Batman Caped Crusader is the latest animated series to dive into the early crime-fighting career of Bruce Wayne, aka Batman. The show aimed to balance action, mystery, and character development. The creators sought to create a visually striking series that would resonate with both longtime fans and new audiences. Did it? Well, join me now as I give you an overview of the entire season. Is it good? Is it bad? Is it worth your time? There's a lot to say about this show, so let's get going. But before we do, hit that subscribe button, make sure your bell notification is turned on to all, and give this a thumbs up and share it all over social media. Doing those things really helps WCBS. And folks, just copying the link? Well, that counts as a share. Batman the Cape Crusader is the latest animated series to explore Bruce Wayne's early crime-fighting career. Set in a noir-inspired Gotham City that echoes the dark tones of the animated series, Cape Crusader is a visual feast. The show's greatest strength is its art style. The show not only feels like Batman the Animated Series, but this show is able to capture a feel of the early 1940s as well. The character designs offer a unique vision of the familiar Batman cast. I initially wasn't sold on the look of Batman. I understand its influence and respect its representation, but I was skeptical. However, after watching the series, I not only got over it, but I liked it. This was the Batman I grew up with. Batman was heroic, not gritty and overly dark. The look reflected it. It's not going to rank higher than the original animated series, but I did like the design. The rest of the character design is just as good at reinterpreting classic comic book costumes for animation. We'll talk about character changes like palette swapping later, but the designs for other characters clothing in Gotham City itself were excellent. The show was able to really capture that vintage look the entire time you're watching it. There's less retro-inspired technology. Batman doesn't have a bat computer. He has a see-through dry erase board. It's a very analog take on the character. I've never really wanted to watch Batman operate like this, but it really works better than having Batman being connected to every satellite on Earth like in the modern era. The visual tone of the show felt very authentic. The art combined with the music and voice acting really immersed me in the story. There were writing elements that removed that immersion, but we'll talk about those in just a moment. I could write a video essay on just how much I enjoyed the character design alone, outside of two characters, which we'll talk about again in a moment. If you like Golden Age comics or old American movies, then you're going to really enjoy the look of this show. As a random aside, the women were surprisingly thick for a cartoon, too. I guess that's why it's on Amazon. It's not really a criticism or a critique, it's just an observation. I'm sure I'm not the only one who noticed that either. The show is more than just a showcase for art. However, as an artist myself, that's the first thing I always think about and the first thing that always stands out to me. That being said, the writing here can be good when it's about Batman. Batman Cape Crusader sets a serious tone, diving deep into the character development of Bruce Wayne, some of the time. Bruce Wayne is portrayed as a multifaceted character who must occasionally take beatings and appear foolish to maintain his secret identity. This approach humanizes him. I liked it because it felt fresh. It adds layers to the person showing the lengths he'll go to to protect his secret identity and his dedication to the mission. I found myself enjoying the Bruce Wayne moments as much as I do the Batman crime fighting. The balance between his public image and his secret life is handled quite well, and that highlights the inner tragedy that is Batman. The show's portrayal of Batman is one of its greatest strengths, that is, when the show is about him. While I've spoken positively about this show, it has a big problem. It likes to prioritize other, more diverse characters and forgets that it's a Batman show at times. This show suffers from the fatal illness that some call the curse of the modern year. It's a supernatural curse with an unknown origin that ruins everything it touches. The show has some modernization issues that really ruin the immersion of the story. Some people will call them woke elements. I'll try to use more descriptive language to avoid sounding repetitive. There's a ton of gender and race swapping. Of course you know the Penguin was a woman, it's not great, nor is it as prominent as you'd think, either. 
Let's call it the lesser of all evils associated with this show. The episode was fun to watch. The penguin was ruthless. She killed someone very close to her, very brutally. Outside of the gender swap, it's the penguin. The musical theater performing penguin. Positives aside, it diminished the authenticity of the experience. So much effort was put into making this show feel like Batman, but changing the characters killed some of that immersion. Now, the race swapping was quite confusing. A comic book character's identity is 100% based on their image, and so many of these characters don't look right. The first episode follows a vaguely ethnic woman with brownish hair in a courtroom. She's a lawyer defending her client. She's not referred to by name. After the trial ends, she's finally referred to as Barbara. I spent a good chunk of time watching Barbara Gordon, and I didn't even realize it. That's a problem, too, because I spent a lot of time watching Barbara Gordon. At times, this is Barbara Gordon dressed crusader, because we watch her take center stage for far too long. This is not a good way to handle characters. We're supposed to recognize these characters instantly. It makes little sense to make them unrecognizable. I kept forgetting I was watching Barbara Gordon. She felt like a completely new character, one that I didn't root for. She is very much a girl boss character. She's aggressive, ill-tempered, and doesn't need a man, bat, or other. So many early episodes are about this version of Barbara instead of Batman. They really overdid Barbara Gordon in this series. By the end, I didn't want to see her or her father again. We've seen Black Commissioner Gordon before. Jeffrey Wright is great in Batman. But there's a big problem the producers of this show overlook. It takes place in the 1940s. It doesn't look like an alternate reality or a more fantastical one. It just feels like the regular 1940s, except... It's oddly diverse. They use modern diversity standards in a throwback show, and it feels very disjointed. It's no longer a show set in the 40s, it's a show set in 2024, but it looks like the 1940s. The whole point of this series is to immerse you in the past. This kills the purpose of the show. Plus, it's very on the nose. It's not one or two changes, it's like 50% change. The episodes increase in amounts of modern issues. First, we have the stereotypes of the angry black girl boss. Then we follow the only honest cop, Montoya. We all know she's a lesbian, and that's not a big deal, but we're also taking the spotlight from Batman, the main character. She does more detecting than he does. Harley Quinn is unrecognizable in and out of the costume. Instead of a blonde woman, Harleen Quinzel is a Rubenesque Asian woman. While a nice combination, this isn't exactly Harley Quinn. The show explores lesbian relationships and feminist issues as well, but again, it takes place in what looks like pre-war 1940s America. If it were Batman of the modern era, then these things would feel a little more relevant. But every aspect of this show features some modern upgrade that makes this show very dated. It may be an attempt to make future generations believe that the 1940s were a time of progress and growth, or it may be the idealistic worldview of the creators who live in Los Angeles. No matter the real reason, it makes the show less palatable. It took something artistically beautiful and made a mess of it. That's the tragedy of this show. Harley Quinn's mission was to dupe old white men to give their money and donate it to women's charities. She then holds them hostage and makes them wear demeaning costumes, all while she psychologically tortures them. This killed my immersion in the show because it was blatantly obvious what the writer's message was. We're dealing with organized crime and corrupt cops, and now lesbian socialism and redistribution of wealth? Yeah, great job, showrunners. While I'm very unhappy with all these modern intrusions, my biggest complaint isn't the lesbian love affair or the Asian Harley Quinn, it's the fact that 5 out of the 10 episodes are more about that than Batman. Batman is featured, but not always as the main lead character. Barbara Gordon was the lead of the first, Montoya the lead of the second, and after the third episode, it wasn't until the sixth that it felt like a Batman show again. Four of the first five felt like Birds of Prey, and with them is also Batman. So much was put into them, but then they instantly go to the background. Harley leaves, Montoya gets less screen time, and there are thankfully episodes without Barbara Gordon. They took up so much time, but their impact on the story is nil, so their inclusion felt like a waste of my time. They were just there for people like me to make videos about this show. They don't fit the story. I blame J.J. Abrams. J.J. Abrams' work often incorporates elements that align with feminist themes, like challenging traditional gender roles and stereotypes. He thinks that these changes will appeal to a broader audience. By featuring strong, independent female characters, Abrams can resonate with a wider demographic and appear to contribute to a more inclusive storytelling landscape. Additionally, he believes that these characters can serve as a positive role model, inspiring viewers and challenging preconceived notions about gender. That never happens. What happens when you change an iconic character is you set your cause backwards. It always goes the same way. Hollywood changes something beloved. Fans don't like it. They accuse the fans of being something horrible, and they double down to fight the alleged hatred and bigotry. 
Eventually, interest in the property wanes, and there's a fallow period. Batman is too big for that, but this will impact a portion of the audience. There are over 200 million Prime subscribers. That's a lot of potential Batman viewers. The only thing fans really hate here is change. These are iconic characters and incredibly important. Even the smallest of changes pisses off fans. I wasn't going to watch this show initially because I didn't like the shape of Batman's mask. It's not a stretch for someone to skip this show if their favorite characters are done dirty. All of the articles and feminist op-ed pieces can't save a bad show. Those tweets don't count as views. That audience doesn't matter. You get more Batman fans by making great Batman. That doesn't mean you need to retell the same stories over and over, which is another massive mark against this show. One of the most recurring themes of Batman in media is the return to his early days. Since 1987, we've been retelling the early days of Batman more and more frequently. It started with Year One. Then we got Batman 89, which kind of retells some of Year One. Then we get Mask of the Phantasm, which recounts the early days of Batman and how the mob took over power. Kind of like Year One. Then Batman Begin comes out and retells Year One. Its sequel, The Dark Knight, retells The Long Halloween, which is another early seminal story for Batman. There was an animated version of that fairly recently, too. Then we got to the New 52, which eventually gives us a retelling of Batman's early years. Then the Batman showed up, and shows us a Batman very early on in his career, dealing with crime and police corruption. We are stuck in the same cycle of Batman stories. We have been for almost 40 years. We keep getting the same Batman story, and critics keep eating it up. Batman Cape Crusaders is no exception. While this period is rich for storytelling potential, it's a well-trodden path that feels redundant. The show does its best to offer a new perspective on familiar Bat elements, but one has to wonder, can we stop going back to the early days of Batman? Please? I guess the distinguishing feature here is the time period. We've never seen this era. This time period is again one of the show's biggest strengths, but the modern viewpoint is distracting. However, setting a story in the time before cell phones and modern technology enhanced the drama and suspense. The limitations of that force characters to rely on wit and resourcefulness, creating more compelling and intense narratives. Batman is not only powerful, but smart. The show utilizes his resourcefulness and makes Batman a detective again. Seeing Batman solve crimes without a computer is much more entertaining than I realized it would be. Batman's reliance on technology has eliminated a lot of the danger he faces, therefore lowering the stakes of his adventures. If Batman is in a suit of armor, a gun is no big deal. This show depowers Batman by making the arsenal much simpler. Radios, grappling hooks, and fists are what get Batman through this show. Setting more entertainment in the past can offer a refreshing perspective and challenge audiences to engage in a world devoid of modern conveniences. In particular, the absence of technology like cell phones can significantly enhance storytelling. This show features Batman facing off against supernatural elements, and it's fun to see Batman go to a bookstore or meet with an old wise man for more information on the occult. Seeing Batman talk to Alfred while at a computer for exposition gets old. Seeing Batman be so active in his detecting feels new, which helps the tiresome elements of this show and makes it a little more palatable. The real tragedy of this show is that it finds a way to take some boring, overused elements of Batman and make them feel fresh again. It is beautifully designed and animated. It is atmospheric and well-acted. It is almost great, and it almost immerses you in the world of Batman. But it can't quite stick the landing. So much of the show focuses on the B characters that have been changed to the point of being unrecognizable, and for very obvious reasons. The contrast of modern sensibilities with retro aesthetics is jarring. It creates a very disjointed show. The episodes are interesting, even episodes where Batman is in the background find a way to be mostly enjoyable. Your mileage may vary, but the show does enough to warrant a second season. The character development and action make it a show with significant potential. However, future seasons need to balance these strengths and eliminate their approach to social issues and put a greater focus on Batman himself. The showrunners must listen to the fans. Too much time was spent on characters that aren't Batman, which takes away from the series. When the show is about Batman, it's great, but so little of that first half is actually about Batman. From episode 6 on, the show rectifies this problem, but four of the first five episodes may be enough to turn off the audience. By addressing these concerns, Batman Cape Crusader can build on this foundation and deliver something truly worthwhile in the future. For those who do not want modern cultural issues in their 1940s period piece Batman, this show is not for you. You will not enjoy the changes, the race swaps, the gender swaps, the feminism, the lesbianism, the socialism. God, so many isms. I'm not a fan of isms.
This show adheres to a lot of actions and beliefs tied to so many isms that it's the downfall of this show. Had they stayed a little truer to the look of characters, you may have had something impactful, but this show's ideology is very upfront and hard to avoid. Stick with Batman the Animated Series. You'll be a lot happier that you did. If those things are irrelevant to you and you want classic Batman, you will more than likely enjoy this series. It's well acted, beautifully crafted, and fairly fun. The low-tech approach to Batman feels new in animation and makes the smaller threats that Batman faces seem more impactful. Batman really needs to stay grounded. So folks, those are my thoughts on this show, but tell me yours down below. So folks, instead of three questions, this is how we're going to do it. One, if you've watched this show, tell me down in the comments below. Now, if you watched it, tell me if you liked it or didn't. And also, if you're not going to watch it, tell me why. I'd like to know reasons why you have no interest in this show. Is it superhero saturation? Is it Batman is not your jam? Or is it the social issues you've heard people talk about like we do in this video? Let me know down below. I find it interesting. But folks, this has been an interesting year for superhero animation. Earlier in the year, we had X-Men 97, and now we have Batman Cave Crusader. Both shows bring back the classic creators to work on these iconic characters. Both shows have great strengths and many weaknesses. I think I might do a video on that about which was better. Tell me down in the comments if you want that as well. I'm more of a Marvel guy, but Batman the Animated Series is the greatest cartoon of all time. And I have to say, that's a pretty big statement to make because I really like Marvel comics. That is why I've become a comic book artist myself. So folks, thank you for watching. I'll be back next time with more. Go to stealingsolo.com right now to get yourself a copy of my comic book about a group of disgruntled Star Wars fans who kidnap Harrison Ford and force him to remake Star Wars in their basement. And you can also check out Wokebusters. We just passed our crowdfunding goal last week. So thank you to everybody who made Wokebusters happen. And we keep getting new backers. It is still open for those who want to grab a copy before it goes to print. So folks, thank you. I appreciate all the support for everything you guys do. You are the best. Until next time, folks, be smart. Be safe, be cool, but always be excellent to each other. Stealing Solo asks the greatest what-if question of all time. What if a group of disgruntled Star Wars fans kidnap Harrison Ford and force him to remake Star Wars in their basement? That, and a whole lot more, is answered in Stealing Solo, a Captain's parody. Stealing Solo has been called Laugh Out Loud Funny and the greatest Star Wars parody since Spaceballs, and it's available now for a limited time only. Go to StealingSolo.com, which is powered by Shopify, so you get the reward-winning safety and security, and get yourselves a copy today. Once we sell through this limited back stock, I'm going back to the drawing board to bring you the sequel, which parodies Luke Skywalker's Fall from Grace, and finally the closing chapter, which I can't wait to get to, Frankenfisher, The Bride of Solo. And yes, it's exactly what you think it is. So folks, the only way to get that is go to StealingSolo.com right now, get yourselves a copy, and enjoy the greatest Star Wars parody since Spaceballs.